Hey, what's going on guys? So in this episode, we're going to talk about two very important valuation metrics and they include EV to EBITDA and EV to EBIT. Now EV to EBITDA is a far more popular valuation metric that's widely used on Wall Street and with investment banks for valuing corporations. But in my view, I think the EV to EBIT is actually a far more informative metric to use um, for valuation purposes. And now Typically speaking, um, I know that during my time in equity research, you would typically use um, either one of these valuation metrics in conjunction with the P.E. multiple, largely because, like I said in episode two, when I was discussing um, price to earnings ratios, uh, that multiple doesn't consider uh, the debts of a particular business, whereas an EV to EBITDA or EV to EBIT does. So. That's something that um, is, is a critical and a very important difference between um, the valuation metrics that we're going to discuss today versus the P.E. multiple. And if you're not familiar with the P.E. multiple or with enterprise value, these are two subject matters that I discussed in earlier episodes. And I, and I highly recommend you to review those episodes prior to jumping into this one if those two uh, concepts are brand new to you. So without further ado, let's kind of dive in. Let's discuss, okay, how do I interpret these multiples and how do I employ them in, in the real world? Just a quick note, for those of you who are already familiar with these metrics, I definitely recommend you just skip right on ahead to the tail end of the episode where I'm talking about a specific case question. I think that's where you can extrapolate a lot more meaningful content and lines of thinking that you could uh, utilize for your own fundamental analysis uh, when you're considering other investment opportunities. Okay, so let's start this conversation off with the far more popular EV to EBITDA metric. So um, like, I how, like how I say it, it's all it is is just enterprise value divided by EBITDA. And EBITDA is an acronym, and it's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's kind of long-winded, but all you need to know is it's simply operating income plus depreciation and amortization. If you want to do extra work, you can start at the net income line, add back taxes, um, interest expense, and then work your way up to adding depreciation and amortization. And that that's another way of arriving at EBITDA. Okay, so the way to typically uh, use this metric uh, and the way it's often widely used is for comparables analysis. And so if you were to arrive at the EV to EBITDA multiple for a particular company, you would kind of juxtapose that against its uh, competitive peer group. And that would be the gauge for the, um, the priciness of the company that you're looking at. Okay, where is the EV, EV to EBITDA multiple trading at versus where um, its peers are trading at? And so that's kind of how one way to uh, think about this particular metric. Another way is um, oftentimes when a company goes and buys another company outright whole or buys some, subse some sub segment of that business, uh, disclosures are oftentimes made around um, the price that was paid and the associated EV to EBITDA multiple that was um, involved in that transaction. And so that's the metric that's oftentimes disclosed, in my experience, far more than any other metric. And so that's going to be informative to investors around uh, what similar assets can be um, trading at or, or could be worth in the private market. So a uh, quick example, in December 2018, outdoor advertising company Lamar actually went out and bought billboard advertising assets from Fairway Outdoor Advertising for 12 times trailing um, EBITDA multiples. So when I say trailing, that means trailing 12 months EBITDA performance. And so, uh, like I said, that's informative to investors around what similar assets, similar outdoor, you know, billboard advertising assets could be worth. But with that being said, it, it's, you know, to extrapolate that and apply that 12 times multiple to say every single um, um, billboard advertising company out there is it is somewhat of a theoretical exercise because um, we're not always going to be privy to the synergy benefits that were associated with that particular uh, transaction and you know the synergies that are associated and unique to one specific transaction can um, meaningfully um, impact the valuation multiples that were applied now, nonetheless, with that being said, it's still some guide and some proxy for what um, an appropriate valuation could be for a similar grouping of assets. 
Okay, so the reason why um, EBITDA is such a widely accepted profitability measure is because it strips out these non-core or incidental expense line items like taxes and um, interest expense. In addition to that, these non, non-cash expense line items like depreciation and amortization. So like I said, again, depreciation and amortization is a non-cash expense line item on the line item on the income statement. So just really quickly for the new folks who aren't necessarily all that familiar with depreciation and amortization, um, whenever a company goes out and buys a fixed asset, whether it's like a factory or commercial property or some heavy equipment, um, the cash outlay is made at the time when the asset is acquired. But um, over time, uh, that asset is going to degrade or depreciate in value due to normal wear and tear, right? Just think about your own personal car. Over t- it's not gonna last forever. Over time, it's going to kind of depreciate and it's going to undergo wear and tear. That's actually recorded or recognized from an accounting standpoint on the income statement under the line depreciation and amortization. So let's just quick example, say you bought um, a piece of property for, or like a building for a hundred bucks and it has a useful life of 10 years. Well, over the next ensuing 10 years from an accounting standpoint, the value of that asset is gonna decline by $10 over the next 10 years until the total value of the asset is depleted. That $10 decline or expense is, a, is an accounting construct. You're not actually shelling out or outlaying $10 every single year. That cash outlay had already been made at the time uh, when the asset was acquired. It's just being recognized on the income statement over the ensuing years um, in equal increments. So that's kind of how to think about depreciation and amortization. It's not an actual cash outlay. That cash outlay was already made at the time that the asset was acquired. Now, with that all being said, for the very reason why EBITDA strips strips out DNA is the reason why, in my view, it's a less informative, less informative profitability measure. And so, just a quick, re- quick few reasons why I, th- I think um, DNA has to be considered in the profitability, um, the profitability calculation of your business is because. I'll, I'll just quick example. Say if you say if you own an airline company, right? You're the sole owner of Delta or Con- United Continental, uh, and you buy a Boeing 737 um, aircraft for 150 to 200 million dollars. You have to consider and factor that cost into the profitability of your business. Otherwise, it does it makes no sense to completely disregard that um, that cost or that investment into the P and L. It's it, it just I hope you see that it doesn't make sense whatsoever. Also, um, if you were to if you were to strip out DNA from your profitability, it's kind of like pretending as if your business can go on with its existing base of assets into perpetuity, as if those assets are are um, it's like a one and done expense, and you never have to worry about uh, reinvesting into the business. That's kind of overstating. Uh, your earnings uh, and the profitability of your business. Every business needs to have some level of reoccurring reinvestment into the business for it to to continue on. Uh, And so that's kind of the reason why I think EBITDA overinflates the profitability level of a business. And that's why EBIT is gonna be a more useful gauge of the profitability of a business. Okay, so moving on to EV to EBIT. Um, EBIT is simply uh, another acronym. It's just earnings before interest taxes. And, and it's completely completely synonymous. It's the same thing as using operating income. So again, just similar, just like EV to EBITDA, it's enterprise value divided by operating income. And if when you're using this metric, you're kind of sidestepping all of these issues that we just discussed about EV to EBITDA. You, now you are considering depreciation and amortization. Now you are considering um, the ongoing reoccurring uh, reinvestment into the business. Uh, it, that assumes that DNA is some proxy for how much reinvestment is going to be required going forward. 
Now, um, just a little quick side note, if you were to compare and contrast EBITDA versus EBIT, that could kind of offer you some insight into the capital intensity of a business. So usually um, much more capital intensive businesses, meaning businesses that have a higher level of fixed assets, they're going to have a higher level of depreciation and amortization expense. And so, um, the wider, um, theoretically speaking, the wider the differences between EBITDA to EBIT uh, is going to give you a picture of just how capital intensive a business is going to be. And another quick note, uh, if you have two businesses generating the same level of income, yet one business is far more capital intensive than the another, you would generally want to own the less capital intensive business because it requires far less reinvestment to generate the same level of earnings. Um, and so that's just something to consider whenever you're looking at EBITDA, EBIT, and uh, these associated multiples. So moving on from the theoretical conversation regarding the EB to EBITDA and EV to EBIT multiples, I definitely want to get into the meat and potatoes of this episode where I'm talking about a real life example. So if you go ahead and take a look at my screen um, and t take a look at the Excel file that I have for you here, we're going to do UPS as a quick example. So UPS, the first starting point is arriving at market capitalization. So the way to get there is we're going to need to get to price and shares outstanding. So uh, let's go ahead and pull Yahoo Finance up. I've saved it right here. So if you see that, you know, as of the most recent closing date, as of March 22nd of this year, it was $107.35. Shares outstanding. Where do I get that information? You get that from SEC filings. So if you navigate back, I already have it saved here. Um, I'm just gonna do, uh, I apologize for the blurriness of the screen. So I just did a controlled find of the word weighted, and that should navigate me all the way up to the diluted share count. Um, diluted share count. Okay, diluted share count for uh, fiscal year 2018 was um, 870 million. 870 million implies a market capitalization of 93.4 billion dollars. Total debt to the company. So we're gonna have to navigate back to the 10K filing. This is a 10K filing uh, as provided in the SEC Edgar database. Um, let's go and navigate over to the balance sheet. The financial statement and supplementary data, consolidated balance sheet. So uh, this is the balance sheet. In, under current liabilities, there's gonna be current maturities, long-term debt and commercial paper. That's about 2.805, 2805 billion. And then under, long-term debts it's going to be 19931 okay now controlling interest is 16 million cash okay so um up here you have these two line items this is cash and cash equivalents and then right underneath it is marketable securities i'm going to treat marketable securities like cash as well because it's basically investment securities that the company ups has put its money into which it could liquidate and sell without losing much value at all within 365 days so it's it'll mimic or it behaves much like the way cash does. So cat, I'm gonna treat it as cash. So cash is 4225 plus, um, whoop, what's going on here? Plus uh, marketable securities of 810. So your enterprise value for this company as of the most recent market close is um, $111 billion, over $111 billion. So let's get to EBITDA and EBIT. These two metrics are on an adjusted basis, uh, the most convenient place to go is actually the earnings release uh, as the most recent earnings released uh, as provided on the investor relations page. So I have it saved right here. 2018 as adjusted is 7384. Uh, seven, for is your EBIT. So, sorry, if you go ahead and go back up to, you see that operating profit? Operating profit is essentially the same thing as your operating income, which is the same thing as EBIT. 
And now the difference between EBIT and EBITDA is depreciation and amortization. If you just do a quick control find on this earnings release of depreciation, it's not disclosed here. So uh, if it's not disclosed here, and probably because um, this company doesn't like this doesn't like to report earnings on an EBITDA basis, which I think is a good sign. It, pr it probably you know dis um, discloses earnings on an operating profit or EBIT basis or earnings per share basis. And so you know that's a good indication that management uses EBIT as a performance measure as opposed to EBITDA. And I think yeah, I think that's um, that reflects a lot on the company. So uh, if you don't have depreciation amortization, the next place to go is straight to the 10K and the cash flow statement of the 10K will tell you what the depreciation amortization is. So if you just do depreciation amortization or the income statement as well, uh, depreciation and amortization for 2018 was 2207. So you're going to do EBIT plus 2207 is going to get you to an EBITDA on adjusted basis of nine point roughly six billion dollars. So these are the multiples uh, on a trailing 2018 basis. So of where uh, UPS is trading at. So UPS is trading at 11.6 times EV to EBITDA and uh, 15 times 2018 EBIT. These multiples on a standalone basis aren't going to be all too, too informative for you as an investor. You'd have to compare and contrast these multiples, UPS multiples with where say DHL and where FedEx are trading at or in, in the, the wider competitive peer group. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, um, this is a perfect segue into the next part of this conversation. Okay, so moving on to the next page here, I, uh, I wanted to be able to start, um, I wanted to introduce you guys to one quick case, case scenario. So uh, I think this case is gonna be reflective of what could oftentimes occur in real life situations. So um, let's just hypothetically assume um, the scenario, right? So UPS sold a major business unit inside of itself um, to FedEx for 19 times the EV to EBITDA after tax. So, uh, and also the unit generated um, 2018 EBITDA of $3 billion. So here are the questions. Okay, how much did UPS sell the unit for in aggregate? Uh, and what does uh, UPS's capital structure look like now post-transaction? And lastly, assuming UPS's multiples remain the same post-transaction, what's the implied share price? So um, I want to kind of walk through this exercise because of uh, it's a good depiction of how capital structures can dramatically change due to major transactions and how uh, value management can unlock value through uh, some of these kinds of transactions. So how much did UPS sell the unit for? Well, we have the multiple 19 times EV to EBITDA and we have EBITDA. All you need to do is 3 billion times 19 that unit was sold for $57 billion. So obviously the company is going to shrink in size because it just sold a, ma a, ma a massive part of its um, asset base. Uh, so what does EPS's capital structure look like now? So what you have to do is you do enterprise value minus um, the size of that particular business and cash you know, assuming the whole transaction was done in cash, is going to consequently increase proportionally to the size of the transaction. So your cash is gonna go from 5 billion to uh, about $62 billion. Now, assuming everything else remains the same, this is kind of, and let's reverse engineer this math here. So, market capitalization remains the same, per share price remains the same. Here's an interesting situation, right? What is the new uh, new question to your uh, case scenario here? What's the new EBITDA and what's the new implied multiple? Well, uh, your EBITDA is gonna adjust down by 3 billion and the implied multiple now suggests that the company post-transaction is trading at 8.2 times um, EBITDA. So that's kind of an interesting scenario. Um, Assuming that you know the margins of the business remain, the profitability meaning, 
uh, of this business remain the same post transaction does it make logical sense that multiples would shrink down from uh, uh, from 12 to roughly around 11 11 and a half times EBITDA to 8.2 times maybe not so that's why I wanted to ask the question assuming UPS's multiples remain the same post transaction now what is the new implied share price okay so let's look at that situation let's say uh, multiples remain the same and your new uh, EBITDA on a trailing uh, 2018 basis uh, is six point roughly six billion dollars so all you need to do is your um, enterprise value should be 76.4 billion dollars so now let's say cash is you know where it was 62 uh, billion um, nothing else related to the capital structure changes as far as far as debts go and let's reverse engineer the math again here reverse engineer meaning go from enterprise value go all the way down to market capitalization so you take your enterprise value you would add back cash and subtract your debts to get to market capitalization and you subtract not controlling interest so your new implied market capitalization is about 115.6 billion dollars um, assuming that shares haven't changed the new implied share price is now almost $133 per share. That's your answer here, right? Uh, $133 per share. Due to this transaction, this val this incredibly value enhancing transaction that management was somehow able to pull off, you just got 23, 24% upside in the intrinsic value or the value of this company because uh, it's been able to sell a unit within this business and generate such a substantial level amount of cash where um, the capital structure has now dramatically changed such that the implied market capitalization and the implied per share value is far higher than where it was previously and so um, that's a that kind of a, maybe the the multiple in which this business unit uh, was able to sell at is probably un, a little unrealistic but you know this kind of change in the mix between your equity and your debt that's a real life scenario and I, and I wanted to walk through this case so that you can kind of see how um, how these valuation metrics work in tandem with how uh, with how you know, capital structures can evolve and change um, due to these transactions so just as a quick recap the example that I just walked through it's it's not far-fetched at all it's actually something that I discussed in my most recent episode concerning uh, Newell brands ticker symbol NWL I'll leave a link for you guys at the top of your screen for you to navigate to um, after watching it if you have any thoughts or um, comments or opinions I'd love to hear from you guys so let me know and regarding this episode if it was if it was helpful in any kind of way I'd really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and give us a like um, leave some comments any kind of questions I love to hear from you guys so um, yeah all this all this content by the way it's also available on podcast uh, all you gotta do is type in get that bread value investing and you could find us there so yeah I'll see you guys on the next episode all right take care guys bye